What your part that plays, Trip? Oh, oh, no, 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 not me, no. I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> but uh, I'm not against the occasional live role play. I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. And you're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Yes. And this episode is your ticket to the winter fete. Do you like seeing people in tents doing tricks? <laughs> it's the winter fete. I do, actually. It's right? I'm going to party. Also... Also, we are now more than halfway <laughs> through Shadow and Bone. Yay! I always get excited when we get towards the end because... You know, the story's coming to an end, so everything is coming to a head. I thought you were just going to be like, I always like when we get to the end because it's almost over. That too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I've enjoyed covering the series. I think it, it's our first, like, YA book slash show that we've done. We did Midnight Sun. Right. But we only did, like, I mean, we only had the book to do. Yeah. Also, that uh, that season was kind of like a joke to begin with, but it was fun doing it. So it is fun doing these. and. You know, I'm excited. I'm excited to finish this and wrap this up because there's so many other things that we have planned to cover. I'm excited. Same. <laughs> I just feel like with anything, it's like you're you're presenting this one thing, but you're already thinking two, three, four steps ahead. Literally the first episode that we did this, I looked at Derek and I was like, what are we going to do the next season? And he was like, really? I was like, I, I got to know. I have to know. <laughs> yeah. And then I just shed one tear, take a deep breath and say, all right, we're in this together. Let's jump like Aladdin and Jasmine. Y'all should see our calendar. <laughs> oh, man. I love that calendar. <laughs> all right. Before we get into this episode, as always, remember, we have that Patreon. Pick an exclusive episode, something for us to cover. You got it. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter. Facebook at a bite of pod. We got a Facebook group. You know all the the normal stuff by now. I mean, we're in like season six? Question mark, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I looked at my notes to make sure. <laughs> so follow us on there. Check that social media. We have a giveaway going on that's shadow and bone related. So if you're listening to this and are a shadow bone fan, you might want to check that out. Surprise. And <laughs> do it. We love giving you guys stuff. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. All right. So before we go forward, we must look back. So in Shadow and Bone, episode four, Old Katsatsya, Mal is on the hunt for the stag while Alina begins to come to terms with the fact that she might never see him again. As she goes through her training and gets to know General Alexander Kirigan, she begins to let go of her past to embrace her sun summoner powers. The crows have made it safely through the fold and now must figure out how they are going to get into the little palace. A heist ensues and Nina and Matthias are on a boat. Yay! Mm-hmm. We don't see Nina. By the way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no mention of them at all. They died. The storm got them. That's it. <laughs> the, the boat capsized. End of story. They never joined the crows. They completely write them out of the series. <laughs> oh, no. That I was like so them. sad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, and of course, spoiler alert, yep. especially for this episode, so much happens. Yeah, a lot happens. This is like where the big twisty stuff, mm. I'd say this is like twist one of two of the first book slash season. Yeah. So be warned. Yeah. And also, it's like crazy spoilers because spoiling things from the books, but then they change so much for the series. So it's definitely spoiling the series too. So even if you read the books, you're still going to be spoiled by this episode. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you read the books, you've already watched this show and we're just stretching out yeah, this watching. Yeah, you guys are like, it came out four <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> Enough. Have you heard of Netflix? You can watch all episodes in one day. Yeah, it's we know. binging. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Got it. Let us officially take a bite of Shadow and Bone, episode five. Show me who you are. Ooh. I mean, okay. <laughs> some of these, some of these titles, I'm like, uh, I don't know what this means. There's like that one, like two episodes ago, it was like, "Show me you are the center of the world in my oh, heart the heart monster. at the center of the world." Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, that one you lost me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So titles aside, again, the opening title card changes. This one was really cool. It was like mm. a double phoenix mm. thing. Yeah, I think that's like what's sort of on their keftas. You know, I didn't notice that, but some sort I of believe crest. it. Yeah. 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 Embroidery. Great work. Oh, please. Get me an embroidered kefta right now. (laughs) 
So we'll set this up at the beginning. So Mal made his way back to the first army encampment that he left from to go hunt down the white stag. There's some slow-mo. Oh, yeah. He's injured. He's crawling there. Other first army men go up and pick him up. I mean, it is kind of sad because it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. His best buds just died, and he's all the white stag, and a lot has happened for Mal. Agreed. I mean, this moment really was like 1917 <laughs> Academy Awards cinematography, slow motion, <laughs> yeah. running to save him. But I agree. There's this moment where he's stumbling in, obviously because he's injured. He, I believe he was shot by the or machine gun or something. something. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, he was shot. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so he stumbles and he falls down. And then as he comes back up, it's kind of like, oh, he's alone. Yeah. You know, but he's he's made it back to Chernast and he's there to deliver the news. Yeah. And fast forwarding a little bit, because this scene I don't really want to talk about in the middle of everything else. The commander is about to send word to Alta Alta mm-hmm. that they found the stag and Mal, still injured, goes in there and he's like, hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. Because the whole reason why he's doing this is he knows that this is his ticket to go see Alina. Mm-hmm. And that's why he wants to do it. So, of course, he's going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to be the guy to deliver this news. So he's like, okay, both of you go. Yeah. Go to the, the little palace and deliver this. I'm also hoping it's the last time we see this general character guy. I'm he, sure he has a name. I just don't care to remember right. it. And whatever scene he's in, he's always just like making some dumb proclamation and getting people into trouble. I'm pretty sure he doesn't like the Shuhan. So also, fuck him. Middle fingers. Well, I'm not also saying all the Shuhan are great, but you know what I mean? He just seems a little racist. Racist. <laughs> we don't have time for that here. Yeah. <laughs> so the next thing we get, the crows have landed in Ooh. Alta. They're at the little palace and they get confronted by, well, I don't want to say all the crows. This is just Jesper and Inesh with Arkin, the conductor with them, and Marco, the guy that runs the traveling troop. And they get stopped by the guard at the gate to pretty much I, tell them where they're allowed to be in the little palace. So like, you can't go anywhere else except for the grounds. Yeah. And just tonight. <laughs> You're not a guest. You work for the queen peons. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was also, so I'm curious, do these, are they just regular guards or are they Grisha? Because they're, they're uniforms. I don't even want to call it a kefta because it didn't look like it. It's just like black with a little bit of red. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I thought that they were just guards, but we see later on that they can be Grisha. Right. Which is so, but interesting. You know, maybe it's a mix of Franks. Although they don't feel like the type that mix things. So they're probably all Grisha. Probably. You know? Yeah, that's true. Maybe we gotta look for like collar colors next time. <laughs> Figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> and in the same scene, we do see somebody remember Derek. In the, <laughs> the last episode, you said, what if Kaz is underneath the carriage just holding it? Yes. Trying to sneak in because we were like, how is Kaz going to get into this? Somebody literally did that. Some like fanatic for the yeah. Sun Summoner that's like worshiping her and just yeah. wants to go see her. They catch him. So it's like, good thing Kaz didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like for me, it, it's a it's a that's so Raven moment where I saw the future, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But you were close. I was close. Right. You just missed the Sun Summoner fanatic. Right. I just, that was a small detail. I'll get it <laughs> next time. But cool. The crows are there. They they made it to where they needed to go. Mm-hmm. The next scene we get, Alina seems like she's at home. Mm-hmm. Every scene, it feels like the last couple of episodes we've seen Alina, she's in her room with other Grisha there, and she just seems happier and happier. Mm-hmm. This one, it opens with Nina and Marie, and they're just it's, I mean, for lack of a better term, girl talk. Girl talk. Yeah. Right. They're just kind of talking and having fun. And then Jenya comes in and needs to get her ready for the winter fete. So super exciting. I always love these Taylor scenes because it's just, they're so well done. They're so cool. Just how, just seeing the science <laughs> of how she holds the color that she wants to put on them. Mm-hmm. I mean, even just makeup aside. All the other stuff that she can do. I, she like walked by Elena and flicked her wrist and her hair came undone and also kind of curled. Yeah. I'm like, how? What is? How do you do? What? <laughs> it's the little science. <laughs> you like your little baking soda volcanoes? Well, look what she can do. I mean, for me, this scene is pretty interesting because it shows Elena almost in like this mean girls storyline where mm. she was Katie 
as the outsider in Mean Girls, uh, right? Right. She sort of had to infiltrate it and come in. But now you almost feel like, is she losing herself? Because she's completely letting go of her past. I don't, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say she she's going the whole, like, Katie Root and Mean Girls of, like, becoming a Mean Girl. But she is more of, like, I think she's just accepted. She's like, okay, I'm here. Right. I need to just embrace it. Exactly. So yeah, I'm not cool. saying that there's a burn book. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. Jeez. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think that she's really embracing it and she's made some friends there. And, you know, she's smiling. She mm-hmm. wasn't really smiling a lot in these because she didn't seem happy. So it's nice to see that, oh, I made these two friends that don't care if I'm Shu. Jenya doesn't care that I'm Shu as well. This is the first place that I'm like accepted. Yeah. You know, and throughout their conversation with Jenya and Alina, it's interesting. She's putting on the makeup on Alina, trying different things. And Jenya tells her that she's like, I don't mind making the queen look beautiful in the morning because it averts the king's gaze to her. And off of Jenya. Right. So we're still getting a little more of what we knew from the book that uh, there's like sexual advances from the king on Jenya and she was kind of put into that servitude, Mm -hmm. which isn't great. And it just makes you feel for Jenya and it gives another like layer to the character that's like, I need to know more about this. There's there's something here that's darker, even though Jenya is just like this ray of light. Yeah. Everything is crooked in this particular kingdom. Like a crooked kingdom. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Ah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alina also tells Jenya in the scene that she's going to wear the black kefta going forward. She's like, you know, that blue stuff, whatever. So she's fully giving herself over, not only to the Darkling, but to this whole, okay, I am above, I am like a certain status with the Grisha, and I just need to embrace it at this point. Yeah. But for me, again, this feels, it doesn't feel authentic to Alina. I feel like mm. she's, Alina is, down home she's dirty she's army you know what i mean she's not afraid to get in the muck and the mire and here we see her getting pretty and being silly and and although that's a good thing for the character it doesn't feel true to her because yeah. i think this is her convincing herself that i'm going to be moving more towards kirigan this is my future this is what i need it doesn't necessarily feel like that's what she truly wants that's what i'm taking to believe i think if we didn't know kirigan's true motivations I might feel a little different about that, but it's like, since I know Kerrigan's motivations, at least for like this first part of the book, I don't mm, want to spoil mm. the rest of the, the series for people, but it's like, ill. like, I, I just like, don't wear the black. Don't yeah. wear it. <laughs> and in the book, not to be like, but in the book, she never really leans into the black. She yeah, never she, has this moment right. where she's like, I'm doing this now. Right. Exactly. Which is, yeah, so it was a little bit of a departure from the book, mm-hmm. for sure. There is a moment, too, where Jenya tells her, she warns her to be careful of powerful men. Mm-hmm. I think Jenya's seeing a little bit that she's changed. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I see you getting cozy with General Kirigan, so just be careful. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 this makes me question, since we know, especially what happens at the end of this episode with Kirigan's real motivations on why he wants the Sun Summoner, does she know at this point? I don't think I realized that or thought about it during the book because you don't find that out until after this, but it's like, she would have to know what Kerrigan's plan is. All of these, these Grisha that are at least helping Kerrigan enact these plans. Like, I wonder if she does know. Maybe, but maybe not to the full extent. I think for her, especially with the conversation that she just had about the king, what she's saying to Alina is you need to be careful because these powerful men always have an ulterior motive oh right you know so for a point in her life she thought she was coming into this great position in in the palace Mm -hmm. and really was it because of her power or was it because the king wanted to get closer to her i mean so i think that's what she's sort of reflecting on alina is like i'm happy that you seem happy but i think that you need to be careful because you're letting your guard down a little too quickly there's also that point too where if jenya does know some of his plan and he was the one that put her into that position this tailor mm-hmm. you know you're going to be like the queen's whatever she needs you to be and i'm going to kind of turn a blind eye to what the king's doing to you i'm curious if kirigan needed that to happen because he was putting his pawns in place because he knew that she needed to be there for eventually whenever they get poisoned or the 
you know, the Royals get taken out of the picture. So it's, it is just a more like, ah, oh, you're gross. Yeah. I mean, as we know, he does have that basically war board in his True. chambers, right? Where he's moving pieces all over the place constantly. One of those papers on the walls has to be that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So also I was waiting and I, I mentioned it before. I was so waiting for David to come into the picture and into the show. And I'm so happy he finally made his debut ah. into the show. And we talked earlier about how she didn't have those mirror gloves. They make an appearance in this episode, but it's not the mirror gloves with like the mirror discs. No. It's like a chain mail-y glove. Okay. This is a long (laughs) shot. Does anybody remember the infomercials of the Ron Co. (laughs) set it and forget it? No. Okay. So there was this guy, Ron, of Ron Co. And he made (laughs) all these crazy inventions. And one of them was like this rotisserie that you would set it and forget it. Uh But then- he would take the boiling meat out of these things with these giant gloves. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. These are the gloves that David has gifted. <laughs> it's to like Alina. butcher gloves. Yes. Where they like, you can't cut yourself you on You can't them. cut yourself. Right. They're like heat proof. I yeah. mean, this is exactly what he puts on Alina, but they have some sequins on them. I, I'm <laughs> true. Well, was it, it seemed like chain mail-y to me. Like it didn't seem like there was like. I don't mirrors like it just made more sense in the book for them to be mirrors. You know what I mean? For oh, it to yeah. like reflect, reflect and light or prisms. Right. And they said that this glove will help you make like multiple balls of light or whatever. I don't get how that works, but also I hardly get how the Grisha do what they do. I mean, in the second book, scholars can make lightning. So like, <laughs> oh, my God. Spoilers of a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us haven't started the second book, Noah. Oh, so why well, I already told you that. If, well, uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's not a spoiler. Everybody, everybody's so mad right now. Everybody shut it off. <laughs> They're like, actually, Derek, you're the only one that's watching the series and hasn't read the entire seven books that are out Probably. there. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so it is it is funny because I, I did like David. I like the actor that plays David. I thought he the reservedness and the kind of unassuming nature of david mm. and the very like i'm not really going to make eye contact with you and i'm very concerned about my work i thought even just in this little scene i was like nailed it i believe it that is exactly david but then his his sad little the fabricator heart she takes off the glove and then she still makes two balls of light yeah and she's like oh i don't need your gloves actually more easily yeah. than with the gloves <laughs> They were like, the props department was like, look, we don't know what to do with these gloves. Just get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Just get rid of them. They were it's like, fine. we need to mention these gloves because people are going to make a podcast where they complain that the gloves <laughs> right. aren't in there. So just like do it and then we're never going to do it again. The, right. the other like cuteness thing with this scene, though, is that we see that Jenya has sort of a crush on David. And Alina sees that. Immediately. Yeah. Because she's just like outwardly nice to him and Jenya is never outwardly nice to yeah. anyone. Yeah. So Alina's like, wait a tick. You <laughs> like him. And she's like, I don't want to hear any more about this. <laughs> that was cute. So next scene we get, the crows make their plan. Kaz is in costume. He's already in the palace somehow. We don't know. I, we, this is going to be the biggest mystery of the show and it's going to bug me. Are we going to know how Kaz got there? Okay, because before when we were talking about the rest of them getting in, I was going to ask you, was Kaz there? Did we see him leaping across the building or something like that? <laughs> but then I was like, maybe it was very obvious and I just didn't see it. I didn't see it. Okay. All right. I'm glad we're on the same page with that. I'm going to pull a Derek and comment below if you know how Kaz <laughs> got there. And I'm going to pull Noah and say, this isn't Facebook. There aren't <laughs> comments below us. I say YouTube. Ha. Oh. <laughs> well, I made it my own. <laughs> so. Their plan, and I think it's what else are they going to do, is to grab Alina. So he, he's looking at the blueprints and he's like, oh, this is the room that they should be, you know, Alina should change in or get ready for the fet and all of that. And he gets there and he's like, there's no door. Why, why is the door not here? And he's like pressing on the door. Apparently, fabricators can make secret doors. It's like the room of requirements, but only fabricators can well, enter. Well, they're moving the metal. I know that's in it. I, it's like always there, but like it's not really there. It's hidden. Chung, 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 chung. I just pictured the big lock. <laughs> Gorgeous. So Ka- as Kaz is tapping around on this wall, people come. He hides, but he's still lurking in the background. He sees that in this room, there's two black keftas that Alina should be wearing. Mm. We also see Marie in there. Yep. 
So he's like, cool, this is the right room, but only fabricators can open it. Next, we meet up with Inej and Jesper. And Inej is still practicing her aerial silk skills, and they have a conversation. And Inej is talking to Jesper, but he's not paying attention because he has his eye on the stable hand, Dima. I mean, I, I'm happy about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I was over the moon when Nadia was LGBTQ, and now we get Jesper, one of the crows, is crushing on a dude. I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> but the main, the main point of this conversation is we see that Jesper is doing the job regardless, but he's a little skeptical about the Sun Summoner business. Mm. He's like, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Kaz doesn't think it's real. And she's like, but I want to know what you think. I don't want whatever Kaz says, but I want to know what you think. So it, I feel like Inej is like very like hopeful. She has faith. She's like, I hope the Sun Summoner is real, but she's surrounded by people that are like, this is just a job. I don't believe it. It's going to be a light show. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And I think she represents the faith of the group Kaz sort of represents the logical logic and Jesper is the questioner. Right. So they each have this different role in the way that they think about things, which is what makes them such a good team. But we see it here. And I kind of like this conversation between the two of them because she's saying to him, yes, we Kaz is our leader in this, but I want to know who you are and what, right. what you're thinking about this whole thing. Because we're each still people. Also, in Kaz isn't here. so um, Right. That bitch is somewhere in this yeah. mouth. I don't even know how he got here, but he got here. <laughs> Meanwhile, the innuendo conversation that is happening while he is looking at the stable guy is out of control. She's like, we need a bigger carriage. He's like, no, no, no. It's not the size of the carriage, but it's the horse that runs it. You need a powerful horse. Blah, blah, blah. I was like. You know what? You're right. I, re- I remember listening to that and being like. This sounds sexual, but I'm just not going to... I don't think it's sexual, right? <laughs> yeah, it was very motion of the ocean, you know, size of a boat thing. I, I wasn't sure where he was going with it, but I think he was... It was a double entendre. He was doing two For jobs sure. at once. He's 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 truly sizing up the horse, but he's also sizing up the stable boy. I mean, get some demo. Ooh. Get it. So next, we see Alina and Jenya, and they're walking through the little palace. And through the window, Alina sees the traveling troop. They've pretty much set up like a fair out there, like a county fair. Just picture that. And of course, Elena's like, can, 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 we, can we go to this? Mm. Like, can, like, do we have time? And Jenya's like, nah. no, <laughs> no, there's guards and all that. But then there's a sweet moment where Elena like convinces her and they ditch the guards and go. So I, I was really happy about that moment because I'm like, just have some fun. I want to see Jenya and Elena be friends outside of like mandatory time together because she always just goes into the room to make her pretty and then she leaves and i think that was one of the things i mentioned in one of our past episodes was that's sort of the beauty of their relationship in the book is that you do see that kind of concrete facade that jenya has put up Mm -hmm. come down and her and alina become close so this kind of gave us an into that i feel like this episode did a lot of that really brought a lot of those character turns from the books into the series that we haven't seen yeah i i mean I'm just going to say it because I'm probably going to say it at the end anyway. This is probably my favorite episode. Oh, heck yes. Me too. It was so good. There's so many moving parts. All of these storylines are coming together. And it was just great. There's so many cool scenes in this. Action, adventure, deceit. So good. So as Alina and Jenya are walking through this fair, they stumble upon a reenactment of Alina Starkov, the Sun Summoner. And it's literally, if you remember from Thor... The different recreations of like Thor stories from the past movies. This is what that was. You know what? I thought uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. All right. <laughs> Remember they're in the Fire Kingdom and like Toph is played by like this six foot giant guy. Yeah. And she's like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but here the person is played by somebody that's not Shu. Right. So it's clearly they have a different version of this person. This person is white and blonde. And it it just goes to show that people have no idea what she looks like. Mm. That was one of the convincing factors to Jenya to let Alina go to this because she's like nobody knows what who I am right they won't expect a half shoe person to be Alina no way they end up getting busted by Fedor and he he does this funny impression of Ivan because at first they're like oh sorry and he's like no I'm just kidding it's fine Mm -hmm. let's just go back in but guess who's there Jesper is eavesdropping Mm -hmm. 
eavesdropping. Is it eavesdropping? E- it's eaves because when people would be spying, they would be in the eaves of a roof. So they're eavesdropping, listening in. What part of the roof is an eave? Like the beams that hold the roof up. <laughs> oh, yeah, the eaves. Oh. Like the eaves in the attic. The more you know. <laughs> Shooting star. <laughs> <laughs> so our crow, one of the crows has kind of almost met up with the main character of this. So this is exciting. So the next part we get is the crows plan their move part two. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they plan their move a little bit, a couple of times in this episode, because they're finding out a little bit more information. They go into Roadbox. They literally run into a room that's not really there, but can only be opened by fabricators. Jesper ends up telling them this new information. He's like, I saw Alina and she's half shoe. So like, I know what she looks like before we didn't know what she looked like. So here's this information. The conductor, Arkin, says that they can actually get through this door that the fabricators use because it's just a series of locks Mm -hmm. with a lodestone. This is real. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, when I first looked it up, it said a Final Fantasy wiki came up. I'm like, oh, it's fake. No, it's not. (laughs) A lodestone is a naturally magnetized piece of mineral magnetite. I like how... (laughs) Did I say the same word twice? I don't know. Rewind the tape. <laughs> no, I, I, you guys should have seen his face. He was so confident going in. <laughs> and then the last two words just completely lost him. <laughs> uh, I was like, I said that word already. I don't know. They just, are naturally occurring magnets. That's all you need exactly. to know. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why Arkham was like, we need a powerful one because these locks are probably heavy and there's a series of them. It makes sense. Kaz actually tells the conductor that he's going to be the one to go in there and grab Alina. I remember watching this and I'm like, that's weird. And I was happy. And Nez was like, you're going to make the new guy literally do the point of this job. We went through the shadow fold for this and you're going to make the, the new guy do this. And they also plan to have a lynx slush, which are just predators and they're going to use them to clear a path. I don't know where these lynx are. Oh, I thought it was like a formation. Maybe. Like the, I, the lynx flush is... Is it flush or slush? I wrote... Okay, look, I have to be honest. I originally wrote plush. <laughs> and then later on, I think they said flush. I could have swore they said slush. And it's 80 degrees here. So I think that was my brain being like, you want to go to 7 Eleven. So, guys, comment below. <laughs> Let us know what it is. I thought it was like an, a tactical formation. It very well could be. But I just heard lynx and I was like, cat. True. And they said predator. So I was like, okay, so it is a predator. And that's fine. Okay, what we're doing is that we're dissecting some things and defining them on their own. That literally does not happen. In the- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Speculate wildly. Okay, it's our show. We can do what we want. <laughs> this is our show. <laughs> so the next scene we get is Alina meeting up with General Kier again. Oh. <laughs> right, <laughs> right from the beginning of the scene, he asks Ivan for his kefta. And then Alina's there, so she brings him the captain. He's like, you're not Ivan. I mean, General Kerrigan has a huge boner for Ivan. Oh. He, he talks about him a lot. I mean, multiple it's times. his right-hand man. I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> Innuendo. <laughs> Jesper's in my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alina is getting pretty cozy with him. You know, she's putting on his kefta. She just walks into his space willingly without, you know, kind of knocking or anything or seeing startled whenever she sees him now. She's getting too big for her britches. Mm. I don't care what son you can summon. Girl, you need to chill. <laughs> getting too comfy up there in the little palace. Os Alta. <laughs> so in this conversation that they have, they're talking about the demonstration that these Grisha are going to be doing for all these visitors. They're coming for the Winter Fet, this big event. And people invited, you know, political figures, generals, all of these people. And Alina... Tells the general, this is very much the scene where she's like, okay, I know what I have to do. She's like, this demonstration is going to show that she belongs, one, that she is the sun summoner, and hopefully it can offer Grisha and Ravkins hope for the future. Right. Like, that's what she wants to do, and she's hoping that this is what it's for. Sadly, obviously, General Kerrigan, Alexander, has different plans, (laughs) which makes this whole scene more upsetting. Yeah. Because he's just lying so much and it's so gross. Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah. 
What's interesting about this scene is we see her go in and make the move for their first kiss. Yeah, she does make that kiss. Right? Whereas in the book, again, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm sorry. I'm a big book to movie person. It's fine. But they're by a lake and he makes the first move, which makes it a little more predatory in the book. Right. Whereas in this, again, she's like feeling her oats. She's like, look at me. We're going to do this together. Smooch. But I think it's because her feelings are genuine and he's just using her oh, yeah, for a particular yeah, yeah. goal. Like, who knows? Maybe some feelings were there, but it just doesn't seem that way. Well, and I think with him, he's willing to do whatever it takes. Exactly. So it's like luring someone into his trap. He's willing to go along with it. Right. Or they kiss. They kiss pretty in- intensely, mm-hmm. even though Mal is literally on his way. If you just wait five more hours, Alina, just <laughs> wait. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> and also, is it, <laughs> is it weird? Because we know General Kerrigan is old. Is it weird that, like, she's not, like, I know she's going to live like he does, but she's not yet. Like, she is still young, and he's not. So, it, the whole time, like, this is what makes me feel weird about this type of stuff, and especially, I feel like YA tiptoes this way sometimes, where it's like, this guy is, like, a thousand years old. Not General Kerrigan, but just in this genre in general. It's Edward like, and Bella. Right. This guy's... A thousand years old, and this person has not lived that long, so they're technically not as old as you. Is this okay? Isn't it a little weird? No, it's gross. Right? Yeah. No, I think... God, I feel like I've had very similar thoughts to this, and granted, she doesn't know how old he is. And he hasn't aged from whatever age. So she thinks he's just like a 20-something guy, which is still... She's still only 16, so it's still gross. but. I mean, he's literally like hundreds of years older than her. Right. Yeah. It's yucky. It is. It's just a little weird. And I think just like his like dominant nature and stuff, it just feels very like. Mm. Yeah. Very much like when the light and dark come together. It's a gray. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a gray area. Gray area. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> the next scene we get. Jesper goes to the stable hand and scopes out some horses. Or more. But he scopes out those lips on Di- on Dima and gets some smooches in around Ooh, those horses. Yes. And again, we have the light back and forth of the double entendre. They're talking about horses. They're talking about role playing. This is heating up, people. Yeah. <laughs> Jesper's like, I'm not opposed to a little light role play. Oh, slam against the wall. I was like, oh, jeez. <laughs> light role play. Wow. Things got rough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next, the winter fetch. Is in full swing. There's people coming in from all over Ravka. And we hear this conversation between this man and this woman. And they're talking about how the West Ravkin like uprising yeah. is gaining some steam. The separatists. The separatists. There's some Fjordan delegates that are supporting it as well. So, I mean, if they're getting supports from other territories, it's probably not going to be great for General Kirigan nor... The first army at this point. So I think that's going to be something that's more explored either later in the season or starting to tip that way. Yeah. Because I feel like the political landscape and all of that stuff, they might be mixing some other stuff from books. So it's going to be exciting to see that. That just adds like more believability to the world, all this political stuff. Oh, yeah. You know? They're painting a better picture. Right. For everything. There's more details. Guess who else is back? Guess who's back? <laughs> Your girl Zoya. <laughs> yeah, she just walks in. Yeah, she went off. She thought for a little bit. She probably tumbled a few times. Tumble. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, <laughs> she likes that first army tumbling. <laughs> hey, hey, she's got to get hers. She's allowed. No, that's fine. I just think the word is oh is skeevy to me. You want me to sing the tumble surprise song again? No, no. <laughs> Figured. Listen to last episode if you want to hear that. <laughs> But it's good to see her back. Mm-hmm. You know, she's back in the fold, and I think that she's going to be playing a bigger part as well in mm-hmm. the rest of the series. Exactly. We also do see Kaz. He's in disguise again, and he spills some drink on himself, and he pretty much, for some reason, tells Ivan and Fedor, and they're like, go get, go change. You can't look that disgusting in this. I mean, can we talk about these two prissies? Okay, <laughs> right? Like, change your clothes. You look like a hot mess, girl. <laughs> Meanwhile, we see Fedor. Feeding a delicious pastry 
to Ivan. What is happening? I'm keeping my eye on those two. Right? Mm -hmm. They're very chummy. I mean, if... <laughs> yeah. I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I'm curious to see where they go from here. Oh, everybody's coming out of the closet. I love it. Maybe they're just really close. <laughs> Rainbow Keftas everywhere. <laughs> Rainbow Keftas. <laughs> so we find out that the reason why he wanted to do that is so he could go to the laundry to get more outfits, and he gives one to Inej and to Arkin. That way they can blend in, and they can walk around the palace freely. Right. And Lena makes her first official appearance with the gorgeous gold and black kefta. Aww. She just walks into the middle of the room to General Kirigan that's talking to the king and queen. And we also get this little scene of Jenya and David kind of flirting. Yeah. Like Jenya looks behind her and David's like, oh, I wasn't looking at you. And then she looks back and David's like, I'm going to appreciate the back of your head for that's a second. Right. He's like, I've just been very interested in what else, everything else is that's yeah. going on here. <laughs> it's so cute. It was such a, it's so tiny. But it's such a sweet little moment. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. You guys. I like you two together. So after that cute little moment with David and Jenya, the Inferni kick off the demonstrations. We see some fireball throwing back and forth. I was really hoping. Okay. I was really hoping to see a little bit more of all of the Grisha, all of the different orders do their demonstrations. We only see the Inferni and then Alina and Geno Kerrigan. I was hoping for more. Like, where's the squallers? Where are the tide makers? Oh, yeah. Let, let me tell you, hashtag not impressed. Yeah, you saved the best for last. Like, like <laughs> two little fireballs very close to people's heads. Yeah, only two Dangerous. of them just, yeah, throwing them. It's fire will catch anybody's hair on fire. You know how much hairspray is probably in that room? Oh, my God. <laughs> Minerals. <laughs> Hashtag the book. It's like this beautiful <laughs> demonstration. There's water. There's fire. There's steam and mist. Yeah, and Alina uses her light to create a rainbow. rainbow. Right. Super cool. We okay. didn't get that. Hashtag rainbow keftas. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Right? <laughs> but use the hashtag, guys. So <laughs> I will say... That when General Kerrigan and Alina start their demonstration, I was impressed with it. I thought it was it was nice. It was a nice moment for Alina because I think how they did the show compared to the books, aside from the similar thing of her being this all savior, you know, prophesized character, she also has all of that added stuff that the show gave her. Mm -hmm. And so her coming out is much more impactful than it was in the books, I think. Mm -hmm. And so when General Kerrigan claps his hand. Oh, and clap on, clap off the clapper. <laughs> the darkness <laughs> comes, <laughs> comes in. <laughs> Got me with that one. I don't know why. When the darkness envelops the room and she creates her two light balls. But she also changes the color of them, which I didn't know she could do. Maybe it's just dependent on the heat. But it was like blue and purple. How does this work? Is it the sun? It's a prism. Light is a prism. <laughs> so she could separate the colors. Roy Jibiv science. She did it. I mean, yeah. it, it was a really cool moment. And she slaps her hands together and she creates this like dome of light around mm -hmm. her audience. And then everybody starts bowing. Yeah. And they're like, Savior's here. So this is going more into there's people that are like she's becoming a saint. Sancta Alina. Exactly. And Inesh says that. Yeah. Which was like, oh, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? And I think it depends, right? It, I mean, a lot of pressure for Alina. A lot of pressure from <laughs> Alina. But that's the thing is that then you become idolized and to what extent? Right. What are people, what do they want from you? What do they think you can do? What are they holding you responsible for? But they're also accepting her. So I think it's a fine line between fanatical and support. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to have to walk that line. But I will say that this moment, it kind of took me over. I was impressed. I felt like one of the people watching it, I was excited to see her use her powers and be so confident in herself. Um, but, you know, I think it kind of brings up the point of what does this Sun Summoner mean? Like back to that person that was trying to sneak into the palace to see her. Right. They, they could step over the line. It could be too much. Well, yeah, I think it's with any celebrity. To be honest, it's like you don't need their locks of hair, nor do you need to sneak into their house and sleep in their closet. That's just a little too much. You guys need to calm down. They will make an appearance when they make an appearance. Mm -hmm. Just saying. 
I'm just saying. Is all. I just saying. remember the the story of that. I think it was like Justin Timberlake, maybe Ryan Gosling, one of one of those guys. Like a woman like snuck into their house and like oh. like slept there and stuff. It was weird. Well, remember the bling ring? That's a true story. Oh yeah. About these group of teens that they broke into all these celebrities' houses and stole from them. I mean, they can use like less things. I mean, it's but, fine. You know, larceny. <laughs> not great. Well, no, <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> A bite of does not support larceny. <laughs> a bite of does not support larceny and any stealing of any celebrity's goods. <laughs> so the next scene, we see the crows, their plans are starting to move. So Jesper is boinking Dima and he ends up getting horses, which was part of the plan. But it seems like he's a little, he's like enamored. He's smitten by this Dima guy. He's like, oh, you just laid some pipes boy oh i am like i'm impressed that's what i got from jesper <laughs> they were very sweaty <laughs> they were so sweaty so sweaty to be fair they were in the stables and all that hay to me in the stables is worse than at the beach that's just me it smells like poop there's hay everywhere mm. what if the other person has hay fever no sand sand in places that's what towels are for sand no Sand goes through the fibers of anything. <laughs> no. Yes. You get the nice breeze from the ocean. I'm just saying if I absolutely had to pick, it would definitely not be in some poopy stables. Okay, good to know. That... <laughs> <laughs> but don't you, I mean, come on, right? I don't feel that way. You would Hay pick... is, can be comfy. No. You can get a blanket from one of the horses. But I... <laughs> For laying on. Right? And then there's no uh, sand or crabs, a, a wayward seagull. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, happens at the beach? What do you think happens at the beach? That's a better question. <laughs> some of us are there to just get some sun and Comment fun. below. <laughs> Stables or beach? Stables v. Beach. We're going to put it in a story on Instagram. You'll know what we're talking about. 2021. Who's right? <laughs> <laughs> so he got the horses. That was the point of that. Then we see Arkin, the conductor. He made his way into the hidden fabricator room. Yep. That's it. That's all yep. we see from him. Yep. He sneaks in there. Mal arrives. He gets in. He gets stopped by the guard. And he was like, what are you talking about? The stag? That's a myth. Everybody wants to go see the sun. So I'm like, you're a liar. And he was like, okay, if I'm a liar, take me to general care again. Prove it. <laughs> but we see this interesting guard figure somebody we've never seen before <laughs> no and i literally went who is that yeah <laughs> who is that i was like w yeah who was that the girl that was that the map maker that died in like the first episode yeah, yeah. no nope, not her stiff. it's a <laughs> ghost she's back <laughs> and she disappears in tonight and then mal goes into the palace after alina did her demonstration she's walking through the halls like she should and she's feeling herself right and then the apparat just appears out of nowhere and spooks her and he I feel like, so we haven't seen him in uh, maybe two episodes. He, I don't know what to think about him at this point or where they're going with him in the show, but he seems like a weird foreshadowing force or somebody that's like kind of giving her good advice, but I don't know if that's for selfish means. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a really, the depiction of the apparent in the show is lightly hilarious because he's never there. And then he just pops out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. it's not even like he's in the scenes peppered throughout. He's just not there. And then he appears. Right. And I, I feel like in the, oh God, hashtag in the book. I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> but he was really, it felt like another pawn in the Darkling's plan. Right. He was there to help push things along for the Darkling. Whereas here, he, you know, he's, when we first saw him, he's teaching Alina about Marazova. He's telling her about the amplifiers. And then in this scene, he's saying to her, you'll become even more dangerous as people's faith in you blossoms. Right. So it's a warning. Mm -hmm. And and again, it doesn't seem threatening as like in the book, it feels like he's offering her some advice to be very careful. Yeah. He, t he tells her the thing that can topple kingdoms and destroy armies or unite armies and it's faith. Yeah. And people are having faith in her. They're building idols after her. Obviously, a guy was underneath the carriage for God knows how long yeah. trying to get in there. So it's interesting. I, I think that he does, he makes sense. I don't know how crazy or what his end game is at this point, but 
It is interesting that the two scenes we've really seen him in, I don't know what he's trying to do. Like, is he trying to warn her? Is he trying to guide her? Yeah. In a specific way? I think it will be interesting because I don't I I don't know where they're going to pull from the books or if they're just going to completely change it. Yeah, I feel like in the books, he was very much Rasputin. He was very much Jafar from Aladdin, like whispering in the Sultan's ear. And... I mean, it's like an archetype that you got. Right, right. Have, but he right. doesn't feel that way at all in this. I mean, yeah, he's definitely a little creepy, but for sure. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't give off that vibe. He's not I, like a puppet master in this, it seems like. Like the conductor gave me weird vibes from the beginning more than the apparatus. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. Luckily, Jenya comes and saves her and she's like, oh, Jenna Kerrigan needs to talk to you. Takes her away. So we finally get Mal and General Kerrigan, the Darkling. They meet face to face. And General Kerrigan is surprised that Alina's Mal is the one that found the stag. Because he's like, my name is Mal. Blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> I can never say his actual real name no. he's like my name is mel and he's like mel that's surprising <laughs> yeah but you know why because he's been stealing their letters of course he knows who alina's mal is true he's like oh mel it's you because alina's never actually said that mel is my best friend from my childhood in the orphanage or at least we've never seen that right yeah i mean you would think that they would have shown that. Right. So right. The, so when he says his full name to Kirigan, he knows exactly who he is because he's been reading their love letters. Exactly. Which, but but this ne- the rest of the scene is interesting to me. I, I don't know if General Kirigan knows that it's like, oh, is it this Mal? Or he's like actually asking for, or he just wants information. So he pretty much, he asks Mal, show me on the map. He's like, you found it? You found, oh my God, you, like show me on the map. But he's also like, are you sure? It's like, I think somebody would know with the giant halo of antlers right. and it's a pure white stag. Right. That why would he be lying? Also, here again, have you ever seen it? <laughs> what do you know about it? Roasted. Okay. <laughs> so he tells him to mark it on the map and good for Mal. He's like, not until I see Elena. Can't give that payment until you get the goods. Oh, that's leverage, baby. Exactly. Ugh. Exactly. And General Kirigan, and this is what I was talking about. It, does he know that this is Mal Mal? Or is he testing it? Or he knows it's Mel and he just wants some more information to win Alina over, which I'm probably, I'm pretty sure it's the latter because he's like, what's her favorite flower? And he's like, blue iris, not the white one, like right, right off the bat. Mm-hmm. So it just seems like he was like, oh, I just wanted to know what flower to get her. Yeah, they're, they're just playing hardball back and forth. They're having a pissing contest, these two guys, mm-hmm. because they both want to get to Alina for, I think, very different reasons. Yeah, because one is her best friend and loves her completely, and the other one wants to use her. Clocked. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And <laughs> General Kerrigan is like, okay, I'll go talk to Alina, and if you are who you say you are, I'll bring her to you later tonight. Yeah, right. I don't trust you. Liar. Lies. <laughs> Bagra makes an appearance in this episode, and she plays a pretty pivotal part through the rest of this episode. That guard that we saw that we were like, oh, is that the map maker that died in the first one? Apparently, she's working for Bagra. And she goes to Bagra and was like, they found the stag. And she was like, oh, shit. I was hoping they wouldn't find it this early. Listen to me. Listen to me carefully. So she is pulling some strings and she has plans that's been going on. And now we're seeing like, oh, this is why she was so intense on Alina to get her training and to do it right Mm -hmm. and to not. Just rely on the amplifier like the Darkling wants to do. Right. Next thing we get, we get a golden veil again, Alina. She's waiting. It's back, (laughs) y'all. That golden veil. As soon as I saw it, I was like, (laughs) goofy Alina. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She's back. Psych. It's not Alina. We see Arkin come in, sneak up behind this golden veil, which should be Alina, slit her throat. He says, this is from General Zlatan. And slits her throat. We knew he was bad news bears. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but this is like a whole nother like, oh, maybe you did smuggle children and people in and was like selling people. Because- How you know about that train? Right. How you know about that train? <laughs> <laughs> right. Turns out, sadly, this person that he killed was Marie. Yeah. One of the people that got close to Alina during this, Nadia and Marie. It was kind of sad. I was, yeah. It was, oh. <laughs> it was definitely sad, especially because we got to see her being cute and talking about flirting with a boy earlier. What's super funny, though, is that when I was doing my preliminary research for this show, 
I was like, I got a spoiler. I know someone who dies. Mm. And it was Marie. But I don't know. She must die later in the books because she doesn't die in the first book. No. You know? Right. Most people don't die in the first yeah. book. Yeah. Unless you're sure. Ned Stark. And- <laughs> Roasted. Roasted. <laughs> but also in this scene, Jenya comes in when there's all this kerfuffle and mm-hmm. he shoots Jenya. Thank God for those bulletproof keftas. Mm-hmm. But Jenya, I mean, okay, can we, for a second, in the book, it was never let on that she knew how to fight. Seeing her chop at his throat and hold her own, I mean, like, you're just making me like this character even more. Like, I like her in the books. I like her in the show. Jenya forever. <laughs> Noah hearts Jenya. I really do. Jenya and David. I hope they're happy. And Noah. <laughs> <laughs> and me. And me. <laughs> so Arkin runs. He gets caught. And we see a dying Marie on the floor. Jenya pulls back the veil. But she has Alina's face. And in a very sad moment, she was like, I don't want to die with someone else's face. Okay. Stop. Why? Could they? Can they not heal her? Like I, I don't. How, know. What's the extent of tailors, at least in the show? Because tailors are a mix between like fabricators and corporalki. So can she heal? I'm pretty sure she can. If she can heal a scar, I would think that she can heal cuts. That is true. Maybe not really fatal ones. I don't. I just don't know the extent of that. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I remember there being this sort of caveat that, like, she can change things, but they aren't gone forever. Right. They kind of, like, disappear after time. Right. But they'll come back. So if she does remove a blemish or a scar, it it can come back. So maybe something that deep is something that she can't actually mend forever. Okay. As long as she, like, saves her for 10 more minutes until another healer comes in. Do they have doctors? (laughs) No. No. (laughs) I didn't think so. I know. It was sad, though. Yeah, I mean, it was sad. I don't want to take away from that. It was just one of those moments where it's like, I guess we just have to accept that healers can't heal a, c- a cut wound on the Someone throat. Someone needs to fill in the blanks of the magic, the little <laughs> science, because Noah and I have questions. <laughs> Comment below. <laughs> All right. At this point, we find out that Kaz did not like Arkin this whole time and double-crossed him. He he tells Inej as they're they're watching... They're preparing to enact their final part of the plan. And he's like, I sent Ark in there. I saw two Keftas in there. There was going to be a body double in there. I don't trust him, especially after I saw him meeting with the so-called general that he decided to, Marie's last dying words was to hear. Right. (laughs) And it was great. I'm glad that Kaz was that smart. I mean, so many steps ahead. Exactly. Here's what we all need to know about Kaz. Kaz knows everything. Exactly. I mean, That's he's, it. he's very smart. I mean, yeah. they're still in this palace so far in the story, and they have not gotten caught yet. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're smart. He's doing things that he knows he needs to do. I mean, getting those uniforms, I wouldn't have known how to get they those. They had a performance, a costume change, mm-hmm. a murder. Boinking. Boinking. Horses. <laughs> Crazy. Not boinking horses, but- it was, There was a comma in there. Right. Yeah, or yeah. like, just like, enter- Next Space. bullet point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just one. A list. It was a list. <laughs> so, Inej and Kaz see the real Alina. They've been having her their eyes on her the whole time. And they go up to her and was like, hey, you want us to escort you to dinner? So, Kaz and Inej pull um, John Ralphio and Mona Lisa, don't be suspicious, <laughs> and try to walk Alina through the little palace with all these people looking and be like, nobody look at her. We're guards that belong here. Mind your own business. We went to the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> these are fresh. <laughs> but, of course, Jen O'Kerrigan is right there. And what does he have in his hand? Blue, Blue irises. irises. Right. So he took that information that Mal just gave him <gasps> and was like, thanks, Somebody find me some blue irises. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. You know what? Yeah, let's, uh, okay, because I don't trust him. But then guess what? He's got florists coming out of the woodwork with blue irises. Mm-hmm. Are they in season? Is this indeed a winter fet? Maybe some, um, I don't know, fabricator just fabricated some. You know, with our experience and our knowledge of the little science, that is absolutely a possibility. I mean, Jenya could have been like, okay, I'll turn those white ones blue. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> 
She had a little blue beetle. Done. Exactly. There you go. He's got all these Grisha running around like fools. So they let their prize slip through their hands because what were they going to do in front of General Kerrigan and everybody else? They had to let her go. But an Inferni thought they were acting a little suspicious. Mm. They were trying to not be suspicious, but they were being suspicious. Very much like the duo from Parks and Recreation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So he kind of follows them a little bit. Next, that informant that we saw that went to go get Mao tries to kill him. Yeah. She starts chucking daggers at him, <laughs> almost gets him in the goods a she, number of times. She was like, okay, yeah, Bagra would like to see you now. I'd be like, who the fuck is Bagra? And he takes her to the little rock cave, cottage, pushes him down the stairs and was like, while you're falling, I'm going to throw daggers at you at the same time. <laughs> One, two, three, gets him in the side. Oh, but then they have this all out brawl which is so wild. There's a hot poker involved. It was great. I mean, again, Mal's hand-to-hand scenes are great. I am now looking forward to it. If there's not one in the last three episodes, at least once an episode with Mal, I'm going to be very disappointed at this point. He's a Mal fan, folks. I am. I am. I think it's He's pretty Mal well. Pal. Yeah. I'm Hashtag a, Mal Pal. <laughs> I am a Mal Pal, <laughs> for sure. I, I really like Mal. But this fight scene was so cool. Yeah. That same, he had like a, a iron poker and he was trying to like stab her in the eye. She's holding it. She does some like flipping off and pointy things with her hands. We find out she's a durist. Yes. And she bends the metal so that way he can't poke her. Yo, then <laughs> as she's coming to swing around, he picks up a wooden stake. Buffy the Vampire Slayers her right in the armpit, then cracks her in the head. Mario home run edition knocked her out of the park <laughs> it was wild yeah i didn't expect i mean now we know how you kill a grisha beat you, the shit you, of them. <laughs> you, you beat the living shit out of them you smack them in the face with an iron pole and also Ooh. stab them in the pit yes with a wooden stake <laughs> this was it was brutal but i loved it <laughs> it was really good so I don't know about you guys, but like after demonstrating all that, going to a holler, all, all that stuff that Alina went through, seems pretty late. I'd want to go to dinner, which she just told in disguise Kaz and Inesh that she wanted. She was like, actually, yeah, I'm pretty hungry. General Kirigan takes her and was like, you know what? I'm not going to take you to dinner. I'm going to take you to my war room study bedroom creeper creeper room. Yeah, because he <laughs> he 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 can feel things are heating up. He sees things getting a little bit out of control, right? So he knows that Jenya and Marie got attacked. He also knows that Mal is, Mal there. is there. Right. So he's like, look, 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 come, 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 come. I just want to keep you in this little cage so no one else can yeah, get here's to Here's some blue irises, fawn over me some more. Like, I just, whatever. People that like Dark Lena, Darkling, and Alina together, fine. I don't believe it. I just don't, it just doesn't seem genuine to me. Not at all. So it's just every time it's like happening, I'm just like, Ooh, yeah, okay. I get, I get like her point of view, but it's like, you're gross, whatever. They are, they start smooching a lot more and they are about to decafta. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. When there's a knock at the door. And this is when Ivan tells him about the attack with Marie. And then he goes to Alina is like, uh, I got to go real quick. Does not tell Alina that somebody is literally trying to kill her. They killed her body devil. Nope. You might even say he's keeping her in the dark with quote <laughs> fingers, air quotes. I, th- I think people got it. The darkling. Is it a joke if you have to explain it? Listen, <laughs> this is not a visual format. People need cues. Okay, comment below if you need cues. Oh, my God. They're going to be... They've already turned it off after the second comment below. They're, they're and my done. 86th hashtag that I've created in this episode. I'm, I'm going to... If people that listen to this episode actually use those, even if it's like one or two of you, I'm probably not even going to remember these hashtags by the end of it, so I'll be very pleasantly surprised if you guys use them. Did we them. say that? What? Hashtag rainbow character. Just thinking of all the hashtags. Oh, yeah. Hashtag Rainbow Kefta. Yeah. yeah. yeah we totally I mean, it's, June's coming up. Pride Month. I'm just saying. <laughs> if you like us, you have to use that hashtag. Yes. <laughs> all right. 
Just as General Kerrigan leaves, Alina, after being like, I have some business to take care of, Bagra pops out of the wall. There's a lot of hidden doorways in this little palace. The little palace does not seem so little anymore. It's a lot of palace. And do wait, do these lead all to Bagra's rock cave? Is that why she's in a rock cave and not a cottage now? I guess that makes sense. <laughs> well, at least this one door does that she knows how to control. True. So she pops through it and she's like, Alina, you have to come with me. And she's like, oh, okay, bags. I'll, I'll, I'll come with you. My teacher. <laughs> As they're walking through these catacombs slash tunnels, Alina's like, what? What? What's going on? I need, like, can you tell me why we're in this creepy tunnel here? Bagra pretty much lets one of the bigger twists in the first book out. Yep. She tells her that she's trying to save her from Geno Kirigan and from a life of being a slave. That General Kirigan wants to use you for his personal gain. He's the black heretic. I'm his mother. By the way, I'm also a shadow summoner. Also, he's old as fuck. Are you good? <laughs> cool. She's like, also, the Volcra are actually women and children. Oh, yeah, that one too. You know, so just, you know, <laughs> trapped souls in the fold. You know, he's just super old and he spent his entire life using people and he knows how to charm anyone to get what he needs. And at this point, with all of that, it seems like Elena's just kind of like, well, I don't know. You seem a little crazy here. And she's like, he played you. Yeah. He has, he's not a boy. He's an eternal liar. Like he has, he's had an eternity to perfect lying. I'm his mother. I would know. <laughs> yeah. She literally says, her, you never stood a chance. And she also gives this interesting detail where she says he wants to collect all all of Marazova's creatures because he is drunk with power. Yep, that is a hint at book two and book three and the future of where the show is going to go. So, beep, bo, boop. Bingo, bango. You can see where it's going. Mm -hmm. There's not just Marazova stag. There's other amplifiers. Dun, dun, dun. Dramatic yes. hedgehog turning or hamster, whatever that. Oh, I love it. Rodent was. <laughs> so, <laughs> Alina... Is then she's convinced at this point, or at least it seems like it. And Bagra tells her, okay, go. Like, uh, you need to go through this tunnel here. You need to take a right at the fork. There's supplies there. I have people working for me. You'll be safe. Great. Bagra got this all figured out. For some reason, Alina's like, you know what? I'm going to go left. I don't know where it goes, but it's not right where Bagra told me to go. <laughs> It's not right, but it's okay. <laughs> right. I mean, basically, Alina just doesn't know who the hell to trust anymore. Yeah. I, at first, when I saw this, I was like, Alina, you had like one job and it was just to go right. You saw all the food and supplies. Yeah. But you're like, this same way seems longer. Let me go. <laughs> I mean, I remember in the book, a very big part of this was that she needed dried meats and cheeses. True. The right? supplies you left, you left behind, mm -hmm. you might need mm -hmm. that coming forward. <laughs> Next, we meet back up with Kaz and the crows and they're on plan F at this point mm -hmm. because everything has fallen through they've lost Alina multiple times the conductor is off murdering people who knows what's happening I mean Jesper is you know boinking people in the stables having a roll in the hay <laughs> the Inferni catches up with Kaz the scene just picture this it's a cathedral <gasps> and Kaz is hiding the Inferni is like mm, I make quick work of spiders and you know what me and my sister I don't know who your sister is I don't know why that matters <laughs> it's very come out come out wherever you are right he's playing cat and mouse at this point Twinting. yeah and Kaz seems to make some pretty quick work of him he smashes his hand that has the igniter for the inferno and he's like ha got you he starts walking away and just as he walks away the inferno is like I don't need just that hand I do have another hand ha ha <laughs> so that answers the question of how many hands do you need <laughs> There you go. Right? <laughs> you saw the future. On the last episode. <laughs> and the people of the show were like, you know what? This guy Derek is going to question if they could just use one hand. We're going to literally show him where one hand gets crushed and they can use another. <laughs> Thanks, guys. But it seems that they need full range of motion. Right. In order to do it. Unless... I don't know. You can bend steel with just your fingers. Okay. Well, she was touching anymore. it though. So oh, I, that's true. That's true. That's you true. know what I mean. So like, I think there's things that we're just reading too much into, and also not us thinking. read too much into something. Never. Never. We never speculate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but just as the Inferni is about to burn Kaz down, a knife 
gets thrown in the back of that dude's head, and Inej is up on the balcony making her kill, which yeah. we knew from that one episode she didn't really want to kill. It's just not her way. Her faith is very important to her. She will defend herself, but just outright killing is different. In the same night, literally within the same hour probably, she saw her saint come alive. Exactly. And then had to take a life. Right. Her faith is just like blossomed and she's like, yes, I was right. Aha. And then she had to do something that completely goes against who she is. Right. And she seems very sh- shook by this. But Kaz, and I think this is his way of comforting. He's like, you saved my life. Like you, you had to do what you had to do. Let's go. Like we, we need to get out of here. Yeah. But you saved my life. So like, don't. You didn't just kill some random person. Right. Now we're bonded forever. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Do I sound like Ron Swanson? <laughs> yes. You're my little giggly Ron Swanson. <laughs> so tough at times, yet so giggly. Uh, I mean, I wish I was Ron Swanson. Lean into it. I will. I'll be your <laughs> Megan Mullally in real life. <laughs> Alina took her new route and... Leads out from the stables. Mm-hmm. General Kerrigan stalking the grounds. He's like, where is she? He runs into Bagra. You know, Mommy Dearest, she, I think at this point she's had some type of protection or at least she's been, I don't know. She feels like she, she could, like, even though General Kerrigan is the black heretic and he's this, you know, scary guy that might have done all the things that people said he actually did. It seems now from this conversation that he just doesn't need her anymore, which makes me question, like, why did he need her in the first place? I was thinking about that. I think that he needed her to teach the Sun Summoner how to use her powers. Ah, okay. Start the engine and then let me drive. Right. So without her, the Sun Summoner couldn't blossom. But now that the Sun Summoner has kind of reached her peak, he doesn't really need her anymore. So he's like, careful, lady. What's he been doing for the last 50 million years? Sweet talking people. He couldn't learn how to teach people? Growing blue irises. Okay. Well, anyway. I mean, he's a dirk. Yeah. I mean, she ends up telling him that Mal is dead. He's like, your tracker's gone. You could have used the tracker. Sorry, I killed him. He was the only one that knew where the stag was. Sorry about it. Dead. Which I liked because then we see that Mal isn't really dead. So, cool. He's not dead. Yeah. And also, it's like Bagra... I mean, Bagger wasn't killing him because he was Mal. She was killing him because he was the only one who knew where the stag was. And in order to stop Kirigan, she needed to get rid of him. Exactly. And I think she actually thinks he might be dead. Yeah. She thinks that her assassin rocked him in the nads with a couple of knives. Yeah. Next, we see Jesper. He's standing by the getaway. He's like, okay, waiting for them to bring out Alina. (laughs) Alina walks out right in front of him, and just goes right into the assuming chest that they were going to put her in. Yes. And he's like, what? Just, I just, did I just catch the sun summoner with literally not even trying? No effort at all. (laughs) So what, I guess Alina's thinking at this point was, you know what, I just need to get away from here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a carriage about to leave. Let me hop in this empty trunk. I'll be fine. (laughs) Jesper? Sometimes feels very much like Domino from Deadpool. He's just lucky. He's just lucky. He got lucky in this episode. He got even more lucky when he cut the Sun Summoner. Yes. Nobody else could. He's like, I literally just like fucked a little bit, got a horse, put a trunk on there, and she walked right in. (laughs) Have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. What a beautiful moment. (laughs) Kaz and Dinesh come out and they're like, you know, we lost her. We, We didn't do it. And the whole time, Jesper's like, ask me. Mm-hmm. Ask me where she is. Just just go in and ask me. And they finally do. But we don't hear the rest of it, but it's probably like, look in that trunk, guys. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they ride off. And End of episode. Ends. End of episode. So Alina knows, at least from what Bagra told her, that everything you know, even more so, is a lie. The crows have Alina. Mal still has not been able to get to Alina. So this is a complete departure from the book. And that's where we're left. Mm-hmm. So Marizova's stag is still there. The General Kirigan doesn't know where it is. Mal knows where it is. He's still alive. What's going to happen to Bagra? Where's Alina and the crows going? The conductor's probably dead. <laughs> Hopefully. I'm worried that the conductor is going to sell them out. Oh, he probably, for absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely, they they won't need a heart render for him. No, and he's I just going to be like, I'll just I'll just tell you. Don't, uh, I'll tell you exactly what they look like. What exactly. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. Million Kruger, <laughs> uh, the train. No, uh, but I just think it's so interesting how far off from the book this is now. Is Mal going to be tracking the crows and Alina now? I, I would and assume. Will, the, will all five of them come together? Maybe, or the crows will like be like, oh, maybe your cause is bigger than a million Kruger, and then. Mm. They disappeared. I don't know. I mean, that, I think that's the interesting thing about the crows being involved in this. Mm-hmm. How much longer are they going to be involved in it? Are they going to be right along with Elena? Because if they're going to do the events that happen in Six of Crows, like when do they depart from them to then be where they're at with Six of Crows? So right. I, I think it's really interesting. And then where's Nina and Matthias? Uh, are they okay? Right. Where's the storm? Uh, the boat. <laughs> Are they, on a, are they on a little rowboat lifeboat? Where are they going? Are they escaping? I don't know. We got three more episodes. Yeah. Three more episodes and then we're done. Whew. All right. Do we even have time for a special segment? Yes, we do. There's always time for a special always, segment. Always time. All right. Let us get into another segment of Badass to the Bone. Let us meet Sylvia Rivera. 1951 to 2002. I'm calling her awesome activist born in new york city sylvia's life was one that had many falls that she always managed to rise above her father was absent from her life and her mother committed suicide leaving sylvia to be raised by her grandmother yikes assigned male at birth sylvia would experiment with women's clothing and makeup at a young age beaten both at home and in school for this she ran away at the age of 11 in 1963 she met marcia p johnson and in 1969 (gasps) they were both a part of the stonewall riots oh yeah yeah around this time many of the gay activists were cis white men who Mm -hmm. shunned those who did not identify as that from becoming a part of the movement not even allowing sylvia and her fellow trans activists to be a part of the pride parade yeah awful awful i mean it's one thing to know and i'm not trying to step on your toes here it's one thing to know like how the Stonewall rights started and like what really the domino effect for LGBTQ rights and still fighting for them today. But even back then, people within the LGBTQ community and still today is not great. No. Even though a lot of people want to be like, we're accepting blah, blah, blah. You need to accept your own community before you start spreading that. Hell yeah. And it happened then. It's happening now. It needs to stop. It's absolutely gross. Continue. Sorry. And that's why Sylvia is <laughs> so amazing is because... Even though she was, they were trying to quiet her down, she never stopped. She always pushed back. She knew. She knew. And, and throughout her life, she created two different group homes for trans youth to live in and, and to be taken care of because so many of these kids were thrown out of their homes. Um, she never gave up the fight for trans representation and the fight for LGBT rights. She has been honored by having a street named after her in the village There's a portrait of her in the National Portrait Gallery. And this year, in 2021, they are going to erect a monument uh, with both her and Marsha P. Johnson in New York City. Hell yeah. So, you know, Sylvia is a badass because she showed that you should never give up on yourself and your rights. Exactly. And just wanted to put that out there. I'll put this in the description. There is a Marsha P. Johnson organization that you can donate to. Any amount helps. It goes to trans people it goes to people of color it goes to displaced people and it's amazing i mean i've donated that donated there before you you should too i mean don't even don't even worry about our patreon donate there go and do that all right i think this episode is long enough Whew. i mean it's compared to some other podcasts it's not nearly as long <laughs> but till next time guys bye thanks for listening to a bite of artwork and editing by our own noah be sure to subscribe and follow us on instagram at a bite of pod and on facebook at a bite of if you have questions recommendations or just want to say hi you can email us at a bite of pod at gmail.com you can find us on all podcast platforms please be sure to rate and review to spread the word hope you join us next time on a bite of bye